not everyone has an opportunity to experience a miracle, but I have seen one. Brittany and R.T. Floyd welcomed their daughter, Hannah Thomas, into the world on May 27, 2020. Four days later, she would be in a fight for her life as one of the youngest cases of COVID-19 on record. Welcome to A Stronger Faith, a podcast where everyday people share real experiences that transform their faith. I'm your host, Stacey McCanns, and we pray that God uses this conversation to move you in your pursuit of a stronger faith. Today, Brittany Floyd shares the miraculous story of her newborn daughter's battle with COVID-19 and the community of faith that strengthened them all. So let's meet Brittany and jump right in. So Hannah Thomas was born, um, had great, you know, just cried out like a a normal baby, beautiful baby. I got to hold her for the first time. No, um, nothing unusual to the doctors. Um, So we don't know if she was positive for COVID-19 at that moment. Um, We didn't even know we were positive for COVID-19 at that moment. Mm. I was not tested by our hospital going into delivery. And so, therefore, I didn't know if um, there was any exposure there. So, we have her, and fast forward day two, she's perfect, you know, just doing all things a baby would do. And day um, two, we were released from the hospital. Um, went home to be with the brothers um, who are 11 and 6 years old. They had been staying with my parents while we had Hannah Thomas in the hospital. So have a huge family support system, and my parents kept the two children. Um, little did we know that um, my brother had tested for COVID earlier in the week. We knew he had gone in for a COVID test, but the doctor that his general practice doctor did not even suspect COVID Mm. because it was all his, his only symptom was ear pressure. So they did like a lot of physicians at the time and were treating the symptoms and being that that was his only symptom, he was not told to quarantine. So he, um, yeah, that could be a million things, right? It could ear pressure. I mean, where it's the time of the year, March and April that seasonal allergies happen. And yeah. And we were also told to be looking for loss of taste and smell and fever and other things like that. Chills, nothing, um, none of that. Mm. Um, everything that they asked me when I went into the hospital, do you have symptoms of fever, cough or chills? No, we, we don't have any of that. Um, my, so my brother tested for COVID on that Tuesday, um, that Wednesday, we went in to have Hannah Thomas and somewhere along the lines, my parents and my brother were in contact with each other. Um, we, like a lot of families quarantined as a family, we did not quarantine just the, the four of us, my husband and my two two boys and I, but my parents um, help us a lot. So we were, my parents were in a part of our quarantine crew as well as my brother and my sister-in-law and their two kids. This was before? This was before. Okay. So we didn't, um, we didn't, we weren't playing with, uh, we weren't going to school. We were at home. I was not, I was working from home. We were having groceries delivered, trying to do all the things that, Most families were doing to protect their children, and our situation just um, changed drastically. So um, we were released from the hospital on that Friday. By that Saturday, I started developing ear pressure, and I text my family doctor, Um, who's a personal friend of ours, and just said, hey, I'm home with Hannah Thomas. Everything went well, um, but I've got a little ear pressure. Is there anything that you recommend for it? I want to be at my best when I have this new child, so let me know what you think I should do. 
And instead of getting a text back, I got a phone call back, Mm -hmm. which is very unusual um, for this particular doctor to call back. And he said his first words were, I'm telling you not to worry, um, but your brother just tested positive for COVID. And so naturally, I just stopped dead in my tracks and started thinking, who's been around my brother? Because now I have a three-day-old baby at home, and I have two children that have been at my parents' house And my parents were exposed to my brother. And his next words out of his mouth were, your parents also had some sinusitis-related symptoms. So we got them in for testing too. And originally, I didn't think that they had COVID, but now I'm suspecting COVID from them too. So now we have one positive in our family We have two suspected positives, being my mom and my dad, and the rest of us have been exposed, therefore, we're all at risk. I'm assuming that, were they able to come to the, they might not have been able to come to the hospital. Were they not able to come to the hospital and see you all upon the birth of Hannah Thomas? That's right. We, the hospital did not allow other people in. It was just my husband and I that were allowed to go in. So, um... So was your exposure to them before you went in? Yes. And after you got home, I guess, somewhere yes. between those two. Mm-hmm. Okay. So um, we get home. My The boys immediately come home from being at their grandparents. And that was on Friday. Um, we They picked us up from the hospital. My husband went home, picked up the boys, came back to the hospital. So we could all, as a family of five, go home together. Mm-hmm. Um, again, we had no idea that... There were any, you know, exposure to COVID at that point in time. So um, we pick the boys up. They go, they come to pick us up at the hospital and we go home as a family of five. Everyone's happy. The boys are holding Hannah Thomas. They're all engaging with her. Um, Just we thought things were just perfect in our lives at that point. And By the next morning, I was having the air pressure, contacted the doctor. The doctor tells me my brother's positive, that my parents could potentially be positive, that he's tested them too. And we were immediately told, we know the boys have already, you know, been around Hannah Thomas, but under the advice of two separate physicians at this point, um, my husband has a personal friend that also told us this. The boys and RT need to, my husband, need to quarantine at my parents' house. And you and Hannah Thomas need to quarantine by yourself at home. So I thought that is the worst thing in the world that could ever happen to a new mom that's postpartum with two babies and a uh, two, two um, older boys, two older children and a husband at home. And now I'm being asked to quarantine for 14 days away from my, my family Mm -hmm. with a new child, a new baby. So I thought that was the worst that was in front of us. Um, we all shed tears. The boys don't like to be away from their mom. And I was like, you know, this is what we have to do to protect ourselves and protect Hannah Thomas. So we're going to do what we know should be done, and y'all are going to go to your grandparents, and who they call Nora and Pawpaw. You're going to go to Nora and Pawpaw's with RT, and we will FaceTime. I will call you throughout the day, but we'll be away for at least the next 14 days from each other until we're released from, you know, knowing that none of us have the coronavirus. And so they left. Hannah Thomas and I by ourselves at our home and they went to the grandparents and I've did what a lot of moms do and I just started worrying you Mm -hmm. know what if my child gets the COVID-19 what if I get it and I'm unable to care for her what if my I'm not able to produce breast milk for her Um, all of these thoughts are going through my head So Sunday morning at 2 a.m., 
I, th- I got up, set my alarm to feed her, and which I'd never done, Stacy, with two children. I always let them wake me up. Mm. The boys, I'd always let wake me up. And Hannah Thomas, for whatever reason, I just felt led to wake her up. Um, I don't, don't, can't explain why. Mm. I can now, but I couldn't then. And I got up and I was nursing her. And the, um, I started reading on the CDC's website. Um, you know, I'm, I, re- I research a lot. And I started reading, what if my child, um, what symptoms to look for in a day-old, you know, three-day-old infant that possibly could have COVID-19? Because at this point, I don't know if she's going to have it. And it just, it gave the typical symptoms. Look for fever, look for a rash, look for um, blue, gray around her mouth, look for um, a increased work of breathing, um, different differences in her breathing patterns. And so I just said a little prayer and closed the website, closed the browser. I'm surprised that you were able to find that much it seems like that was still early on enough and i would think that an infant a newborn infant there probably hadn't been a whole lot of cases like that that there was much data to be collected right and i really don't think there you know given what we know now there is not a lot of data that has been collected um, especially on children and infants particularly Mm -hmm. um with Hannah Thomas's situation, she was the very first child at Children's Hospital in Birmingham, Alabama, that was that young Mm -hmm. with COVID-19. So everything, she was basically a guinea pig for a lot of doctors and nurses. It's not very comforting as a mom, a new mom. It's it's not. Um, So we... Going back to where we were on that Sunday morning, um, I noticed that she started sounding really gargly. And I'd already informed the pediatrician on that Saturday that there was an exposure to COVID-19 in my family, that we had quarantined my husband and children away from Hannah Thomas and I, and that we had a newborn, well, baby checkup visit on Monday. So what do I do um, now? Do I come to your office knowing that I've been exposed to COVID? I want to make sure that your nursing staff and your staff is protected. So tell me what I need to do. And he said, well, she was a little underweight when she left the hospital. Uh, And so we we do need to keep a check on her weight. um, Given that y'all have been exposed to COVID, if you have anything that starts looking unusual, give me a call. So I asked him, what, do, what am I looking for? Just to find out what I've researched on CDC's site is accurate. And he basically says the same thing to look for. So that Sunday morning, I'm feeding her. I'm noticing she's not taking very much milk at that point, And that I'm really force feeding her in a way to get her to eat. She sounds gargly. Her coloring is starting to change. Um, she's not... Um, as pink as she was, you know, when we left the hospital, she started developing like more of a, more of a jaundice look. If you've had kids before, it's Mm -hmm. kind of that yellow brown look. And she looked very dark complected and, um, which I thought was unusual. But again, I'm sitting there thinking, you know, to my new mom self, you're worrying for no reason. This is all in your head. Just, you know, you're overreacting. Well, as a, a father of three and witnessing my wife, there's um, there's a lot that goes on, clearly, as you have recently delivered a child. How did you sift through the stuff? Just like you said there, you know, how did you convince yourself maybe that's just new mom stuff? Or how did you differentiate between the real and the emotional side of that? Um, I have a sister-in-law that's a nurse. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of my, you know, when I was talking to the doctors, I'm also talking to my sister-in-law who worked in a general practice office for seven years, very familiar with 
babies. She has two of her own. She's been, you know, I have two of my own. So I've got, I have some experience and she and I just started talking and I was like, you know, this is not how it was with the boys. Is this a girl thing? Is this the fact, the fact that she's not eating? Is it because she's a little girl and they don't take as much? So I'm asking my sister-in-law, Bailey, is, did Sydney, my niece, do that? And she said, well, no, she, she did take less, but I, I think there's reason to be concerned. Follow your gut and do what you think is best. And so I contacted the pediatrician again and said, now I know there, we have a confirmed COVID positive and this is Sunday and he, the results came that day. My parents' results came on that Sunday. So now I have three COVID positives in our family. Mm. I contact the pediatrician and I tell him, there are three COVID positives in our family. I'm not sure what to do. I am seeing a lot of excess fluid. I'm suctioning her with the little blue bulb that they send you home with from the hospital. And I'm getting some fluid out and I'm hearing a lot more fluid than I would have in the boys do you think there's something to be concerned about and he said well um I think I want to see her I think I would like to see her in my emergency clinic this afternoon so he says do me a favor I want you and your daughter to go get a COVID test now I've had one physician tell me already don't be concerned don't, I don't think you need a COVID test. The baby is going to be fine. You're going to be fine. So in a way I've, you know, I'm going against what that doctor's told me and I'm, that's going through my mind too. Am I doing the right thing? But still, again, I kept going, this is, I know something's not right. I know that this isn't usual for a child at four days old or four days old at this point to have this much gargling going on in her throat. Um, she didn't have fever. I checked her fever. Um, she wasn't coughing. Um, there was just that excess fluid and she's not eating at this point. So I do what her pediatrician told me. I go to this clinic. Um, the clinic was a, an urgent care facility, local facility that was giving us, giving COVID tests. And my husband and boys had already been tested the day before at this particular clinic. So they called, my husband called up there and said that our baby that I mentioned yesterday is her pediatrician would like her tested for COVID. Can you test her and my wife? And they said, sure, come around back. Now they have a full parking lot full of people And all of a sudden, a back door is opening for us again. So I got there so early that there was not a doctor there when they told me to get there. And they said, but I knew there was an urgent, this was urgent. So um, they told me just to take the kit, the COVID swab to the pediatrician and let the pediatrician swab her because the nursing staff was not fully confident in their ability to swab an infant that that small and that young. So I, they swabbed me, and I fly down the street. It's about, you know, five miles from the to her pediatrician. And I get there and text the doctor to say, I'm in your parking lot. And he says, I'm gowning up. I'll be out in a minute to come get you. There are no nurses there. There are no other patients there. It's just the doctor and Hannah Thomas and I. My husband, for moral support, even though we were, you know, I had not seen him since the day before, he pulls up in the parking lot with a mask on and inside of his truck just for moral support to to be there for us. And um, I'm nervous Um, I have a baby in the back of my car that's, I can hardly hear a cry at this point. And I look at her and I said, there is that gray blue that I read about. So I took her into the doctor 
Dr. Pettit is a wonderful pediatrician locally. And I took him in or took Hannah Thomas into his clinic. And I said, Dr. Pettit, I read where there is a blue, you know, a blue gray mouth could be a symptom of COVID-19. And I feel like that gargle, you know, that I'm hearing may be because she has COVID. And he looked, I will never forget, he turned around and looked to me after assessing her. He weighed her, he checked her vitals, and he said, Brittany, I have, I did not, I don't think I gave enough credit to the gargle that you were mentioning on the phone. I am hearing a lot. I'm hearing exactly what you said. And he turned around and said, do you think she has COVID? And I said, yes, sir, I do now. And he said, are you a nurse? And of course, we, we know I'm not a nurse. I, um, but I said, I'm not a nurse, but I'll do whatever you need me to do. Tell me what you need me to do. And You're a mom, which is like the next best thing to being a nurse, I would I'm think, a mom in that situation. And I work in a credit union, mm. and I am far from being a nurse at mm. this point. And he says, I need you to give her oxygen. Um, her oxygen saturation, I can tell she needs some oxygen. That blue that you're seeing around her mouth is because she's not being, she can't breathe. She's not getting enough oxygen. So I need you to suction her like you've been suctioning her and give her oxygen. I need to go call an EMT. He, I'm giving her oxygen. I'm suctioning her mouth. Keep in mind, my husband's out in the parking lot. Once he says I need to call an EMT, I turned around as I'm doing all of this with Hannah Thomas and said, can you please go tell my husband there's an ambulance on the way so he won't flip out. And So this thing just shifted into a new gear. Yes. How did you feel? What what hit you there? It was shifting into a new gear. Um, This is not, this is about to become really scary. Um, You don't know how scary at that point. And as a mom, I get into the zone and just do what I need to do um, for my children. So I don't, there was, you know, I didn't think fast forward what's about to happen. That thought never entered my mind. The thought that entered my mind was getting her suctioned and getting her to wherever she needed to go next to be taken care of. Didn't know what was in front of us. So the EMT personnel, they pull up and ask me which hospital to go to. And I immediately said the closest children's hospital, which is in Birmingham, Alabama. And they took her by ambulance to Birmingham. I could not be in the ambulance. Yeah, that was my question. No. Um, I was suspected COVID. And I asked the ambulance um, driver, do you want me to follow behind you? Or do you want me, can I be in there with her? And they said, well, if you think you're COVID positive, we would rather you follow us. So she went to Children's and I followed shortly behind her to come up there to um, take care of her. (laughs) Do you remember anything about that drive? That that seems almost unsafe. I I, Mm -hmm. I would think that maybe RT could drive you or something. I don't know. but um, And I know he had responsibilities with the boys and, and things like that. But how was that drive? The, you know, I stayed on the phone with RT the entire time. Um, he he wanted to go, and I said, no, our, we have two boys that need you at home. So, you know, this being a, my third child, I've got this. I can, I can go to Birmingham by myself and... I ran home, grabbed a bag, um, and stuffed a bunch of stuff in the bag for about three days worth of hospital stay and got there about, you know, 15 minutes maybe after Hannah Thomas got there. And I pulled up and they didn't want to let me in because I was suspected COVID. And that's kind of when, you know, you're personality changes just a little bit you're like no I have to get in the back my daughter is back there she's four days old and suspected suspected COVID I'm suspected COVID but you're gonna let me in to be with my daughter I have a mask on I will not touch anything I've got to get in the back with my baby and 
they let me back there. And I think the only reason why I was allowed to go back was because, you know, being that I was breastfeeding her, she has to have food, so they've got to let mama in. So I went back there, and she's laying on the bed. Um, They have her swaddled up, and there's two nurses in there with her, and they asked me, um, they said her sugar's low, and how long has it been since she's not had food? And I said, well, I fed her, and I told him the exact time that I fed her that morning. And they said her sugar is a little low, so we're going to go ahead and give her an IV. And so I remember, I did not remember until my my mother-in-law, who's so sweet and is putting together a a, um, baby book for us, and I had done some family updates along the way by text message to keep them all posted on what was going on. I'd put in a text... We're good. Hannah Thomas is do she's doing okay. Her sugar's a little low, and the, so they're giving her an IV. And I look back now, and I think, gosh, you really had no idea what was in front of you. You just thought her her sugar was a little low, and didn't you know didn't have a clue what was about to happen. So um, they swabbed her for COVID event again when we got up to Children's, and. We were admitted into the PICU, which is the pediatric ICU at Children's Hospital, and put in a COVID unit. Um, At the time, there were only probably two or three rooms that on in the ICU that had COVID patients in there. So they told me, once you enter this room, you can't come out. You have to know that. That's something else that we had to deal with was knowing I can't leave the room. You're basically in jail and you have a baby in front of you that is very, very sick. We didn't know how sick she was, but, um, about five, you know, um, I guess I remember sitting in the, in the ER at children's. And I remember thinking to myself, I wonder if we'll be out by Thursday. You know, I wonder if, this is going to take more than four or five days to get it taken care of, get her better and be on our, be on the road to recovery or at least at home with the kids. So I just, just have always thought very positive about things and really not had a, um, I'm not going to think negative if, you know, unless something's really wrong, but I had no idea what was wrong with Hannah Thomas so they do, they ran all the viral panels, they ran the COVID test, they did scans from head to toe on her just to evaluate her. And we go into the ICU and they let me know right away, we have had, this is our, this is new for everybody. This is not something that we have a book on. Um, this is not a disease that's been around or an illness virus that's been around for years. This is new. We have no research for infants. Everything that we're going to try on her, we will, you know, do our very best. But this is going to be a trial for for us. And I just said, okay. You know, this is where we're supposed to be. This is where God placed us. So here we are. Let's do this. You know, let's get her better. And so we are in the ICU and we're getting um, things go great. Things are looking good. She um, is, it seems to be feeling better, still not running a fever. And we, I remember we were getting ready to bottle, introduce bottle feeding because we wanted to make sure that she could eat successfully before she was discharged. And a doctor told me, we're hoping to have you out by Sunday. So I'm like, oh, okay, well, that's, that's not, that's not too bad. And I think it was Wednesday at the time. And she was a week old at this point. And I thought, okay, well, we'll be out by Sunday. Let my husband know. They think that we're going to be out by Sunday. And she has a, another change in her 
work of breathing. She starts breathing heavier. They do an x-ray and they find out her lung has collapsed. Both one of her lungs was completely whited out and the other was almost there. And so what that tells us now is, you know, she had double pneumonia and she had contracted pneumonia as a result of COVID. They had confirmed along that in that period of time that she was positive for COVID. So things shifted and she developed very bad lung issues um, to where she now has chronic lung lung disease. Um, She developed three pneumothoraxes along the way during her stay. Um, She was in at Children's for 68 days from the time we went in on May 31st to be in discharged on August 6th. She had um, a pneumothorax is basically an air pocket in the lungs that makes air escape. So you can't, um, the, all of the, the air cannot stay in the lungs and the breathing is, you, the baby struggles with breathing. Um, we would get very close to going home and then she contracted another illness called rhinoenterovirus. And it was basically a cold and gastro-related issues. She had some gastro-related issues, very minimal from what she was going on with COVID, but a lot of just lung issues. Um, The doctors had no, you know, again, no research to know how to treat a baby of this age. So everything they would tell me is, this is what we've done on adults. This worked on an adult but we need your signature. We need your verbal consent to know that we can treat your child with this medication or with this form of treatment. Um, she was on a ventilator the first time for less than 10 days. And then uh, the second go round, she was on a ventilator for 19 days. So, um, there were lots of things that happened that led us to needing the, the additional support for her lungs to give her lungs time to heal. Uh, so they, they recommended the ventilator. They recommended different COVID drugs that had not been tested on an infant. Um, again, that's a leap of faith in itself to, to say, we know another baby is there's not been a trial done on this drug with an infant. We don't know if this is going to help or hurt her um, to take this drug that an adult has taken in this size, you know, with the certain number of milliliters that they're giving her for her weight. Yes, for her weight. Um, But we feel like this could help her. And so our prayers changed along the way from praying for Hannah Thomas to ask in for very specific prayers. Um, we went from, you know, where the doctors would tell me, this is the medication that we're going to give her and try out. And I would immediately go to the our prayer warriors and ask for them to pray. I'm going to pray over her. I'm going to pray every single prayer that you were putting in writing on a text message. And I'm going to play every single form of praise music that you're giving us on this cell phone in the room. And we're just going to fill the room with God's presence and see if, um, if anything changes. Because so, I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. So you were there, you and she mm-hmm. were At Children's, you say, for 68 days? Yes. So that's a long time. Now, is she COVID positive this whole time? Are there additional complications, I guess, that that you had to deal with? And she remained COVID positive? My understanding on COVID and and with adults, I know that there are some that, that struggle a lot longer than others. We keep hearing this 14-day thing, and, and maybe that's just in a normal, healthy person. Mm-hmm. But was she COVID positive for nearly 70 days? No. Um, she 
went into the hospital on May 31st, so was tested for COVID on May 31st. We got the test back on June 1st that she was confirmed COVID positive. From June 1st to June 24th is how long it took her to shed the virus. They gave her two tests. Every week, they would repeat a COVID test with her. Um, a lot of re- the, a lot of reason UAB, which is University of Alabama of Birmingham, is a research hospital. So they started tracking Hannah Thomas for research purposes, where every day infectious disease doctors came in our room to talk to me about my symptoms, to evaluate her for her symptoms. And they, um, so they watched, they did some nasal swabs, they did rectal swabs, they took blood, they ch- uh, tested my breast milk, um, because they didn't know how long do these infants shed this virus. We, like you mentioned, adults are suspected to shed the virus for about 14 days. But that's all just based on, um, you know, experience and some research on adults. And that, that's pretty much on the safe side that they shed that virus between 10 to 14 days, where they say babies shed the virus for typically under 30 days is what they thought. Mm-hmm. And so every week we repeated a COVID test, and she had her first negative COVID test on June 17th, I believe. And they were like, we got one COVID negative test, but we have to repeat it, we have to have two to make sure she's in the clear. As, and what they meant by in the clear is the the doctors and nurses no, no longer have to be um, gowned up. They still wear their masks, but they don't wear their yellow gowns mm-hmm. when they come in the room and um, the, all the gloves and the, you know, all of the... Sure, protective. Protective gear. gear. So... She retested on June 24th. We got a second COVID negative test. By this time, I have already, I no longer have symptoms. I did develop some symptoms during the stay at Children's. But when I say symptoms, they were very minimal compared to what other people have gone through. Um, I had a little mild cough. um, Did not, it was not bad. I coughed maybe five times one day. So it was nothing, you know, that you wouldn't deal with in an allergy season. Still had a stuffy nose, ran a fever for one night, did not even take Tylenol. I broke the fever without Tylenol and was just very, very tired. But again, new mom, yeah, There's a lot of reasons that you would be tired yeah, other didn't than know COVID. If I'm tired because, tired because of COVID or am I tired because... I have an infant. My my baby in front of me is on life support. She's on a ventilator. And everything I have, all of my energy is going to her at this point. Did she did she test positive after June 24th at any point? Or was the rest of this time dealing with the complications of having it at such an early age. That's exactly what it was. It was dealing with the COVID, the COVID-19 at such an early age. She did not test positive after June 24th for COVID. We were still dealing with the lung issues um, that she had because of COVID. Um, you know, she had, you know, as far as her brain, as far as her heart, all of those scans, her kidney function, all of those scans were fine. She was fine from that standpoint. Um, she was not from the lung standpoint. So we were rehabbing the lungs and trying to get her lungs healed. And along the way, she kept having those pneumothoraxes, which, you know, anyone that's not in healthcare, it's that air pocket that's allowing air to escape from the lungs and the baby's not able to breathe. So you, you start seeing pulling in the, the throat and the chest and, that's, you know, your oxygen saturation, which should be at 100. Her oxygen saturation was now, you know, doing better, but not the best. It was still 
high 80s, low 90s, and that's still a concern. Because what are the doctors telling you at this point about the severity of that? Did they feel like that was, and I know it's a newborn, so nothing's routine, but was that an expected part of this that it's just going to take some time to get through? Or was it a lot more roller coaster ish uh, with some pretty low dips that were scary? Both. Um, there were lo- very low dips that were very scary. Um, I remember one night at two o'clock where it was two o'clock in the morning and around that time and a doctor, we had to change gears. Like this was not every day was a new day. Um, we, it may be a good day for us was nothing new happened. Um, most days were very scary, um, for at at least, I would say 40 something days out of the 68, they were very scary. Um, or not, I heard way too many times. And I remember one doctor telling me, I'm not sure if Hannah is going to make it. I, we don't know if this is the right thing for her. This is something that we feel like we should do for her, but we're not sure how her baby, her infant body is going to respond to this treatment. Um, That evening or that early morning at two o'clock, they had to make her oxygen saturation drop so low that the traditional ventilator was no longer working anymore. So I knew this is a, this is bad. This is really bad. Um, The doctor comes in the room the nurses, there's five or six nurses working at, on her at all points, not just for one day, but at any point in time during, throughout the day, she would have at least four to sometimes eight people in the room with us um, evaluating her and working on her at a certain time. And again, for the majority of the time, I'm in the room with her watching all of this. So any surgery, surgical per, um that surgery that had to be performed, I was in the room for it. Um, any change of healthcare, you know, I was in the room for it. So they said, there is a machine. It's not the traditional ventilator. We don't love to use this machine. We don't like the fact that we're having to go to this machine. It is an older machine. It's called an oscillator. And we are going to try it on Hannah. And But we're also going to give her a medication that's used for premature babies called surfactant, which for babies in the NICU, they take surfactant to expand their lungs to give their lungs like more breathing room. And we're going to try, we're going to try both, but I'm not, I'm not sure this is going to work for her. What happens if it doesn't work? What are you going to do? I don't, I don't know what can be done. And You're hearing this from the doctor. I'm hearing this from the doctor. You're hearing a doctor tell you, I'm not sure that Hannah's going to make it. Yes. What is happening on the inside for you in those moments? You're crushed. You have, you know, you're as a mom, you want to... You want to give everything you have to your daughter. You want to be on the table for her. Um, I don't know other than God, Stacy, that I can explain what came over me at that time. But I looked at the doctor and said, my family and friends are praying for you and your medical team as much as they're praying for my daughter. We are praying for knowledge and wisdom for this this medical team as much as we're praying for Hannah Thomas. And if you feel like that is the best course of treatment for her, then you need to quit talking to me and stand up and go save my daughter because we feel like God is giving you, telling you what to do for her and leading you you to know what to do for her in times that we have nothing to go with. We don't have a book. We don't have anything. We have no circumstances. We don't have even a trial at this point has not been done. 
worldwide. There's trials going on, but they're not finalized. The UAB trial did not start for another 30 days on infants at this point. So everything we're going through is new and where it's all, you know, she's, like I said before, she's a guinea pig to, to everything. So she, the doctor looked at me like kind of with a blank stare, almost like bless her heart. She's really holding on to the fact that this is going to change, that this could change. And I knew that look that I saw was not a good look from any doctor that, you know, was a mother herself and that was actually laying her hand on me during the time of COVID when no one's touching anybody. She's touching my leg and saying, I don't know that Hannah's going to make this. Mm. And I had this like overwhelming sense of strength that came over me to tell that doctor to get up off the couch and go save her. And, um, the nurse, I, she stood up immediately and told the team what to do. She could take three rounds of surfactant, which is that medication to expand the lungs. And so the first they switch her to that different ventilator and they give the first dose of surfactant. And the entire time I'm on my knees praying with my head between my legs, <laughs> my knees, just not watching what was going on. Every once in a while, you know, I would, I would pray and I would pop up and look at what was going on. And at one point they were looking on the monitor and there was a t- an entire team outside of her room of a probably 10 ICU nurses there was two attending doctors in the room with her and about five to six nurses in the room with us that are giving the surfactant. The door is not open. There's monitors everywhere. Hannah Thomas is, again, breathing with a machine only. They give the surfactant, and I see the first thumbs up from the nurse practitioner. And I knew, I knew it, it was God that was in the room with us. There's, you know, you, you're at a very weak point. But you have that sense of strength that only he can give. And it's so early in the morning. The only person that I tried to get on the phone, I tried to call my husband and he wouldn't answer. And because he, um, you know, we thought really until that point, everything was fine. She was doing okay. And so I was giving updates in the morning, but the sh- there was a dramatic shift that night. So I called my mother-in-law. I called my mother-in-law that morning and said, this is what I just, that we're being faced with right now. And I need you to pray. And I don't want to wake anybody up, but we need, we need everyone to pray. And she stayed on the phone with me um, while that was all going on and prayed with me and just talked me through it. And a lot of it wasn't, there was hardly any talking going on on the phone. There's a whole lot of listening and, and praying silently and praying out loud and, you know, just kind of all over the board. But then I heard the nurses out in the hallway. I get that first thumbs up from the nurse practitioner and all of a sudden, nurses start clapping in the hallway, and they're h- hugging and high fiving. And I'm looking like, "What's going on? You know what? What are what are we dealing with?" And I asked, "Is she okay?" 
And they said her oxygen saturation just went up to 100, which is the best it could be. So, you know, you see not everyone has an opportunity to experience a miracle, but I have seen one. When did this happen? I mean, day 50, day... Oh, goodness. Um, Do you know? I have, a, I have it written down. Um, was this the low point? This was the low point. A very There were several low points, but that was probably the lowest that I remember. The, the worst feeling of knowing. I never thought, though, my daughter's not going to make it. I never thought we're not going to leave the hospital without a baby. I thought we're going to leave the hospital with a baby. Don't know what's going to, what that baby's going to look like or what she's going to act like. But I know that with God, everything is possible. And I was reading a book at the time that a friend of mine gave that had lost a child. And it's called The Red Sea Rules. And it's basically a book. It gives you 10 steps to God-given strategies that help you overcome, you know, different situations in your life, very similar to this. And she had given me that book. And so I started reading it and read the book with probably, it took me two days to just read it. And because I was so... The book is very engaging, and it was so helpful for me to read step one, step two, step three, um, and I really just felt like there were so many things in that book that I could relate to, um, that my friend that had lost a child, I couldn't imagine what she had gone through to lose that child, but I never thought... I'm losing a child. I thought, we're praying for God to change the situation and to heal Hannah Thomas, to breathe new life into her lungs, and he's going to do it. He's going to, it's just going to take him time. So even though there were low points in our story, you know, in Hannah Thomas's story, there were so many times that we raised our hands in the air and just praised him and are still doing that. I'm sure I, you know, I I keep going back to this state that you would have to be in. You've, you've come home with a new baby and things are fine. You already are living in a COVID environment. COVID gets introduced to your family and then introduced to your daughter you are postpartum and all the things that go along with that. And it's not just um, the exhaustion of round the clock feedings, but you know, your body's readjusting hormonally and all kinds of other things that happen naturally with that. You're separated from your family as hard as that is. Um, Now you find yourself isolated in a small room for what, two and a half, nearly two and a half months. How did you keep it together during that time? I understand motherly instinct and you just got to do what you got to do to take care of your baby or whatever. But that's, that's an extreme stress. Yes. And, and, and not only just to be there in those situations, but when you find yourself at 2 o'clock in the morning with a doctor who is also a mother who has placed their hand on your leg, letting you know that Hannah Thomas, there's a good chance she's not about to make it right here. And all of the things that just took place uh, that you just described. And this apparently happened, maybe not to that degree, but multiple times during your stay. How are you maintaining your self-control and your composure? And to some degree, it's okay if you didn't. Yeah. yeah. But, but how, how do you do that? You just have to have the, the strongest faith and know that God's there. And you have to lean on Him. There were times that I would go and ask for... I felt so much strength through our prayer group, um, through our family and friends that I knew that were praying 
I would send out updates three and four times a day, a lot of days. Um, and I would get responses back. I started getting responses, you know, that people were texting me saying, I, we just want you to know we're praying for you. Um, let us know what to pray for specifically. So as I would hear from people back home, and as I would talk to my husband, and he would say, Brittany, you don't know what's going on here, but there are so many people praying for our daughter. And so we gained so much strength from the prayers that were sent to us. Um, I had friends from work that would pray, you know, our my CEO at work would send a specific prayer to me every morning. And I had friend co-workers that would send prayers that would, they would record the prayers with their husbands as they're in the bed that morning before they even got up and their feet hit the floor. And they would say, we just, hey, Brittany, we just want you to know that we are praying and we want to pray this with you. Sorry, we can't be with you, but know that we're there with you. And we gained so much strength through knowing that there were so many people being led to God through our daughter. And it was the most confusing experience, you know, like I had people say, did you ever, do you ever ask yourself why you, why your daughter? And I never did. I never asked God to this day, like, why did you pick us, you know, for this? Why did you know that we could get through this? Um, I feel like our daughter, he knew our daughter was that strong and that he was using her to lead people to him. I had people call and say, my sister is not, doesn't believe in God, but now she's praying for Hannah Thomas. And as I heard things like that, I knew this is why she's here. And this is why we're still in the hospital because he's not done yet. He's not he hasn't accomplished what he needs to accomplish through this situation. Um, I knew that, especially in this book, The Red Sea Rolls, and in the Bible, that if he could part a sea and that if he could heal a blind man, this was nothing for him to be able to create, give her new lungs. So I kept praying God, breathe new life into her lungs. Give her the lungs that you created for her. I would lay my hands on her. I prayed so differently than I'd ever prayed before. How so? Because, you know, that whereas sometimes you're going down the road, being a busy mother, you're going down the road and praying for, just saying a quick prayer just to get through the day or saying a quick prayer for your children to make sure that they do a, a good job on that test. Um, you are actually holding the hands of a child or um, placing your hands on the child, on Hannah Thomas, and just praying over her, um, knowing that God is present in that room and telling her God is present with us he's not gonna leave us and you said those things yes to her I think it, you know being that it was just in the room I was in the room with her I'm sure people looking on the inside of that room it, they probably thought she's lost it she's going <laughs> she's going crazy <laughs> I wonder what they're saying now. I mean, did they come back to you and say, what we've witnessed here, I would think, is yes, um, beyond an explanation? Yes. There have been, we've recently gone back to the PICU where, you know, my husband, R.T., and I have always said that we are always indebted to 
the nurses and doctors at Children's Hospital um, just for being patient with Hannah Thomas and knowing that our faith was so strong, with, and not just in God, but we knew that they could do it too. And they have said, thank you for being so patient with us, even though there were times that you probably shouldn't have been as a parent. There were times that you probably should have gotten voiced some concerns with us, but you just stayed the course with us and let us do what you knew we needed to do. Um, I never questioned them on what they suggested for her form of treatment because I was so surrounded by God's presence and knowing he is in this room and he is leading them. So if he's leading them, that is the way we need to go. I'm, did you walk into the room that way? I mean, did, did, is that something, I mean, you're, what would you attribute no. that to? Is that, is that preparation in your life before the situation occurred because of your experiences, the people God has put in your life? Um, is this something, and, and, and the answer may very well be both, is this something that, your own faith strengthened during this time. Absolutely. Did you did you learn things about the nature of God in this experience that you got to experience that maybe it you know, kind of thought or heard of before, but all of a sudden it got real? Yes. I didn't go into the room with the faith with having the faith, uh, my faith as strong as it is now. Yes, I had a very strong faith, but nothing like I have now. I talk, I talk to God all the time. With I go down the road talking to God. I sit at my desk during the day and talk to Him about just little things that enter my mind. And I think the biggest thing that I learned about myself is that whenever I had that moment of weakness or that bad thought entered my mind, what if she's right? What if, what if that lady in front of me has just seen other people pass, you know, pass away from COVID and she knows this isn't going to happen. I just kept thinking, no, it's, she's she's wrong. God is bigger. God can change this. Our family and friends are praying for us. This is, we are not where we are. He didn't give me a healthy baby to have a terrible outcome. Like he's, he's using us for some reason. We cannot explain, but we just have to continue knowing that he is present with us and that he is there for us and he can do much bigger than is being done right now. I sit here listening to you and the things that you have described and the kind of strength required to get there. I would imagine, and I, you know, you hear this all the time and people say, things about God has us for a reason. He always takes care of us and trust and, and all those things. But those are usually said when you're not in the fire yes. yourself, yeah. right? It's said by people who are, who are not getting, who are not facing that in the moment. What I often see in my own self and others too, is when we get in the fire, a lot of times we tend to take control of the hose rather than completely turning that over. Yes. And I feel like I did that in a way. Um, that day, that very first day in the emergency room, me being a planner and wanting to, in my mind, be out by Thursday. Yeah. You know, I mentioned that before. Like, I have things to do. Got, you know, I Let's have a baby. I need right. to get this moving. Um, I want to go back in and check on my, my kids and we got to wrap this up. You know, that's naturally the way I am. Let's just get this over with and get her feeling better and go back to doing what we do every day. And it shifted to where I knew I wasn't in control. I knew that was not 
me being in control was not helping anything. It was hurting our situation. Me not turning that over to God. Me not giving that burden to Him and saying, take this. I don't know what to do with it. I can't do this without you. You have to take this from me because she has to get better. She's my baby. She's my little girl. We've got to bring her home. Her daddy needs a little girl. And knowing that when I let that go, when I gave that to him and heard all of the prayers and felt all the par- the prayers and felt his presence and knowing that those PICU nurses and nurse practitioners and doctors all of a sudden started telling me, we're praying for you. My family is praying for, y- for y'all. We're praying for Hannah Thomas. I remember one situation that now a friend of mine, it was a PICU nurse at the time. I didn't know her prior to Hannah Thomas, but I still talk to her several times a week now because we're that close. And I remember she was checking in on her even when she was off duty and a nurse practitioner was there and had texted her. And little did I know that this was going on, but she, the nurse practitioner, had texted the nurse and said, pray for Hannah Thomas. And that was that another low point that we went through. She needs your prayers. The more I heard that, everyone's praying. I knew God is not going to forsake any of us. He's going to deliver us from this trouble and I know it can be done. Like he's accomplished much greater things than just a baby that he created anyways. I know he can rehab her lungs if I knew he created the lungs. Sure, you know, he can heal sick lungs. So I kept telling everybody that in all of my updates that I'd sent to the family. We are going to stay positive. We would tell our boys, you know, we're very transparent with our children about what was going on. They would ask very, you know, blunt questions that children ask. Is Hannah Thomas going to live? Yes, she's going to live. She is going to live and to tell the story, you know, and we are just going to keep praying that God heals her. And so not only did it change for me and my husband, It changed for our whole family. It changed for our immediate family, being that we had never prayed together like we had prayed together before, like we do now. You mentioned that you pray a lot more now. You pray almost constantly, and I think that's um, that's a that's a remarkable change that can happen in in you when you feel that new closeness in a way maybe that you hadn't before. How else have you changed? You know, certain situations that would have been a big deal before are not now. We um, learned after she was discharged, you know, one of her follow-up visits that she had asthma, you know, with one of the first two children, that would have been devastating to know that my baby has asthma. Now it's just like, we've got this. God's got it. You know, he's got her in his hands. We know this. He's going to, he'll heal this too. It's just a matter of time. Just let's sit back and watch him work. With a work situation that happens to know that, you know, and I have a phenomenal work family that we we pray together as well. Um, To know that certain things that come up at work may be, you know, fires that you have to put out they're not big deals to me. Like they would have been a big deal. Like we tend to take things in stride much more now. What did you learn about the way God works that maybe you didn't have as good a feel for without the experience that you have now? What did you learn about the nature of God and the way he just operates? Um, learned I mean he's a very loving God uh, that 
there you you have you praise him you have to praise him you have to thank him for those those victories you he is going to give you comfort in that in the storm if you seek him i don't think we would be i know it's not a think it's i know we would not be i would not be sitting here with you with the same story if i had have, you know, our entire family and friends had not been praying for our daughter. I felt like people were going to him in groups. You know, there were friends that put together prayer groups in our front yard. And I was home one weekend with our boys and my husband was in the hospital. And we're standing on the second floor in Hannah Thomas's room. Actually, we're all on our knees watching them pray for her and listening to the worship music from what we could hear through the window Mm. and seeing tears and seeing people just go to God. And I think he just has such a loving nature and he wants us all to love like that. How's she doing now? She's great. She's, you know, things could of course, be better. She has a NG tube that goes from her nose to her tummy. So that's how she gets feeds right now. All of her milk goes through the tube. All of her medications go through the tube. And that will, uh, we've seen some progress with um, her being able to bottle feed a little bit uh, in very small increments. We're still only like five milliliters, which is a medicine syringe full of milk, but at least she's able to swallow that amount to practice. Um, That is a result of her not being able to eat for so long and likely, you know, from the ventilator possibly causing some issues with her vocal you know, with her esophagus, we're not sure yet. Um, we go back for several, have several follow-up visits, but she is a very happy baby. She smiles a lot. She's starting to coo, you know, she's gaining weight, which is another huge blessing that we do daily weight checks. So every time there's an ounce gained or ounces gained, we're you know, thanking God for those little ounces too, because we've eventually, we want a baby with lots of rolls. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, it sounds like, and I would think in a situation like this, that, um, you know, discharge from the hospital and being able to come home is just a remarkable celebration, but there's still a lot ahead, I would think. Yes, we definitely have a a long road ahead, especially with her feeding tube. Um, We've gotten some swallow studies back, which she is, you know, not past her swallow studies and which means that she still has to keep the tube in and do the really tiny bottle feeds. But we have appointments um, with gastroenterologist, pulmonologist, rheumatologist, infectious disease, uh, the pediatrician, lots of doctors, lots of care for her. Um, we go to, ch- you know, back and forth a lot. But given what we've been through, she is so much better, and we're very, very grateful for where she's at. Yeah, she's come a long way. Yes, she has. And and with the confidence that you have in your family and your faith, um, I, she couldn't be in better hands, I would think, um, than where she is. If you had to either articulate your greatest takeaway from what's gone on so far since May um, or, uh, you know, articulate your greatest takeaway plus maybe the message from this overall that you would share. I mean, what, 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 what are those things? The, the unknown for anyone is always extremely hard. You know, us having, Human nature is to fix something when something's broken. You know, if the flashlight doesn't work anymore, we put batteries in it. If you 
go to work and something needs to be taken care of, you you fix it. It's our human nature is to fix stuff. And that unknown of her health and not knowing where that course of treatment would take us to where we are now, you just have to know that he is God is present through all situations and that there is nothing too big for him to overcome and accomplish. You just have to seek him and keep talking to him even when you're tired of talking and even when there are bad days. Don't give up on him. Know that he is still there and he is listening. He knows your your heart. He knows your mind. And when you have situations that lead you to have those bad thoughts, you immediately go to him in prayer and ask for him to take them on, just to take the burden because he wants it. And in a way, I felt I've always felt bad for giving him that those burdens, but that's that's what he asked for, and that's what we have to to do is lean on him in times of trouble and know that he's got he's got us. He's take, gonna take care of all of us. You know, I sit here and look at your situation and what you say there, and we think about the love of God, and you and you say, you know, you felt bad about unloading those burdens on him I equate that and the way he must feel about that if Hannah Thomas could have said mom I hate that I have to unload these burdens on you how would you react to a thing like that and I think your answer answer would be baby I am that is what I'm here for that's what I'm here for that's right I love you so much I, I, I don't want anything more than that. That's exactly what I want. Yes, absolutely. And he is our father. And he wa- he craves that yes. from us just as you crave that from your sweet daughter. Right. right. Yes. And I always find that that's a... Uh, after becoming a dad, I, I understand more of what Jesus meant when he said, He is our father. There's a lot of things that come along with that that I can understand a lot more than, than before. So yes. I really appreciate you being here and taking the time. Sure. Thank you. Thanks for having me. When I hear the story of Hannah Thomas and her family, I consider what causes people to be able to endure to this degree. In this family's case, big and constant prayer runs through the entirety of this story. Brittany repeatedly spoke a prayer, whether it be in private, audibly over her daughter, on the phone with family, through recorded messages, in the halls of the hospital, through the many groups and support, and the near constant prayer she now enjoys. There are examples of both group prayer and lengthy prayer peppered throughout Scripture. I specifically think of Elijah's many prayers for rain, seven to be exact, until the first small cloud appeared on the horizon and the assembly of disciples praying earnestly through the night for Peter in prison before an angel freed him. This mentions nothing of David's lengthy prayers and those of Jesus himself when he would remove himself for hours at a time in prayer. Brittany, R.T., their family, and support groups prayed in what could be described as large volume, which is scripturally sound. I hope we all consider what could happen in our lives if we prayed this way. Hannah Thomas is an amazing blessing, and those who have participated in this story continue to celebrate big with every small step of progress. She's surrounded by a community of faith, and I am certain that her story is just beginning as God continues to reflect His light through her. Thank you for being with us today on A Stronger Faith. I pray that you continue to grow in your faith just as I pray for my own. For more resources, or if you feel like you or someone you know has a story of faith that should be shared, please visit astrongerfaith.com to connect with us. Until next time, 
I pray for peace for you and those you love.